lecture is in memory of Georgi Marcus, a Hungarian philosopher who belonged to the small circle of critical theorists closely associated with Georgi Lukács, often referred to as the Budapest School. He was an external member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. He was also on the editorial board of the academic journal Thesis 11, Critical Theory and Historical Sociology. The lecture is titled Developing Marx's Critical Theory, Two Lines of Thought, and will be delivered by Professor Giulio Boltvinik. This lecture will be chaired by Professor Jan Toporowski. May I request the speaker and the chair to please come on stage. Jan Toporowski is a professor of economics and finance at SOAS and holds visiting positions at the University of Bergamo, Italy, and the International University College, Turin, Italy. I request Professor Toporowski to take over the proceedings. Okay, uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Um, it's my great pleasure today to introduce uh, to you uh, Professor Julio Boltfinik. Uh, uh, Professor Boltfinik is at the El Colegio de Mexico in uh, uh, in Mexico, a, a place, uh, a, a country, in fact, of very important uh, Marxian studies. Uh, he's been a, a researcher and professor at the Colegio mm -hmm. since 1992. Uh, his paper today is concerned with the application of the labor theory of value to agriculture and dialectically how such analysis then throws new light on the labor theory of value. Uh, I think this is at the center of many of our, uh, uh, well, center of the concerns of many of us today. So I introduce uh, Professor Boltfinik. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, thank you for organizing this fantastic. Ah, okay. Uh, the best homage to Karl Marx in his bicentenary is the development of his thought. This lecture broaches two lines of development of his thought in which I have been working. The first line is an attempt to link Marx's philosophical anthropology masterfully systematized and developed by Georgi Marcus. This lecture, as can, you can see, is called the Georgi Marcus Memorial Lecture. Marcus died two years ago. Uh, and he developed his, the ideas I will be presenting in the book called Marxism and Anthropology. And I want to link this with a passage in Grundrisse, which can be identified by the idea of the objective limit of capitalism, which is reached as science and technology are applied to production. The Marxist philosophical anthropology explains anthropogenesis as the beginning of human prehistory and the Grundrisse passage signals the end of human prehistory. Uh, so uh, we could uh, see uh, this part of the lecture 
I will explain that it will be all the lecture, uh, as Marx's theory The whole linking of these two texts by Marx, the manuscripts of 1844, and this very little known passage of the Grundris constitute what we can call Marx's theory of prehistory. Not Marx's theory of history, but of prehistory. Uh, for Marx, humanity remains in prehistory as long as it has not overcome scarcity and antagonistic nature of society. Marx distinguishes man from animal by his specific life activity, which constitutes his most proper essence. Man's life activity is work, an activity aimed not directly, but only through mediations of at the fulfillment of needs. Man himself creates his increasingly complicated means of labor in the form of separate independent objects, tools. In Capital, Marx reproduces the definition of man as tool-making animal by Benjamin Franklin. This, together with so sociality, consciousness, universality, freedom, and the most essential fact that man makes himself constitutes the human essence in the Marx-Marcus perspective. Oh, trying to move. Okay. Ah, okay. Uh, so this slide shows the two lines of Marx thought which I will be working. The second line of Marx's thought development is my proposal to generalize Marx's theory of value. I have done this in chapter one of this book called Peasant Poverty and Persistence in the 21st Century, edited by me and Susan Archer Mann, and with a prologue by uh, Lord Meghna Desai. Uh, Marx's theory of value is valid only for continuous labor processes, but not for discontinuous ones as those typical in agriculture where seasonality prevails. This is evident in the fact that Marx's re reproduction schemes stipulate the conditions for the reproduction of capital, but not of labor. My proposal is to add a third equation to the simple reproduction scheme, adding the conditions for the reproduction of labor, but when doing so, the, sim the simple reproduction scheme becomes unbalanced. Thus, I propose to reinterpret Marx's theory of value so that while living labor remains the sole creator of new value, Labor power is conceived as capable of accumulating past labor time value consumed as subsistence means, as do machines and working animals, and then transferring them to commodities as labor power is exercised in work. Thus, the wage laborer working 100 days a year but consuming means of subsistence for 365 days in the same way as the horse or the tractor transfer its accumulated value during the working days. This discussion shows that pure capitalism in agriculture would only be possible if wage seasonal workers received full annual payment continuous payment for this continuous work. Agricultural products would equivalently be more expensive so that surplus value would be unmodified. This is not the historically observed solution, which has avoided pure capitalism in agriculture and developed a mixed agriculture in which family units mostly peasants, have access to land where they produce the means of subsistence for the 265 days a year in which they don't work as they laborers for capitalist farms. 
These ideas have been debated with Megna Desai and Luis Arismendi in the same book quoted, uh, uh, mentioned before. This is not, this line of thought for time restrictions, I could not develop in what I'm going to read. So I'm concentrating in the first line of thought only. And I'm starting with Marxist philosophical anthropology and anthropogenesis, the beginning of human prehistory. Ah, uh, you can see the outline of what I'm going to present in the paper, and at the end I I quote crucial phrases from the Grundrisse passage which revert, refer to the objective I quote crucial phrases from the Grundrisse passage which revert, refer to the objective limit of capi uh, capitalism the end of human prehistory as a result of the application of science and technology to production, whereby the inverted commas, creation of real wealth comes to depend less on labor time and on the amount of labor employed than on the power of the agencies set in motion. No longer does the worker insert a modified natural thing as middle link between the object and himself, no further introduces a tool. Rather, he inserts an industrial process as a means between himself and nature. The theft of all alien labor time on which the present world is based appears as a miserable foundation in face of this new one. Production based on exchange value breaks down. This is the phrase that precises that Marx is thinking on the objective limit of capitalism. And the direct material production process is stripped of the form of penury and antithesis. The second line of Marx thought de uh, development uh, I have read this, sorry. <laughs> okay, I was already, <laughs> I'm reading the same page twice, sorry. Uh, so according to Marx Marcus conception, I'm going to uh, Marxist philosophical anthropology first. Uh, the human essence is to be found in work, sociality, consciousness, and in universality, which embraces those three moments. Yeah. You might not be able to see this, but this is an attempt to put Marxist philosophical anthropology in a diagram. So most of the things I will be uh, saying are included in, in one phrase in the diagram and you can see the dimensions and the levels uh, if you have a screen nearby. The difference between homo uh, in benefit of gender speech I will substitute all the times Marx and Marcus speak of man by homo, which is gender neutral and uh, is more according to our, our epoch. The difference between homo and animal lays in their different life activities. Whilst animal activity is directed exclusively to size and consume the objects of its needs directly, human work is directed to need satisfaction, not directly, but through mediations. This mediated character of work has two 
central consequences. The range of things which might serve as objects of work broadens continually, thus converting Homo into a natural universal being capable of transforming all natural phenomena into objects of his needs and activity. The more the broad, he broadens the objects of his activity, the more he develops his human capacities and needs. The fundamental characteristic of Homo is self-activity, which forms his own object, subject. He is a historical universal being. And the second consequence, the second central consequence is this mediated character of work produces and presupposes a split of the animal fusion of subject and object, of needs and object, in contrast to the animal in which object and motive coincide in human work, this ceases to be the case. This explains why the demand While the animal, sorry, why the animal is not conscious of the world and not self-conscious. Contrary sense, the object world appears to Homo independently of the relation of the individual to it as an objective reality. Work engenders the conscious and self-conscious being of Homo. As a consequence of the practical material multilaterality, almost consciousness becomes universal. In work, but not only in it, the conditions for homo as a social being are also given. Work is always social in a double sense. First, it is group work or else men or women produce for each other. And the activity is always a historical social activity as the means of work and the capacity to use them rely always in the appropriation and application of productive forces and forms of activity created by previous generations. Homo is constituted thus as a social universal being. In summary, the universality of, of the human essence expresses itself in the three features. In dealing with work, hom Homo is a natural universal being. In discussing sociality, Homo is a socio-universal and historical universal being. And lastly, when broaching conscience, Homo is a universal conscious being. Homo is an active natural being, a finite, limited entity, a dependent condition and suffering entity, as the objects of his drives exist outside him as independent objects, which constitute his inorganic body. But this can be said of animals as well. We have to characterize Homo as a specifically human, as a species being. The cause of this difference between homo and animal has to be thought, sought in their respective life activities. Both can satisfy their needs only through their own activity. But animal activity is confined exclusively to sizing and consuming the given natural objects of their need. Their activity directly coincides with the process of active need fulfillment. It is a limited life activity. It can only transform into objects of its activity those objects whose physical, chemical properties satisfy its genetically fixed needs. Homo's specific life activity is work. Work, as stated, is an activity which is aimed not directly, but only through mediations at the fulfillment of needs. It is also a conscious free activity. While the animal's instruments of labor its organs evolve and change only in the uncontrolled millennial process of bio biological evolution. Man himself creates his increasingly complicated means in the form of separate independent objects. Marcus points out besides the two already stated consequences of work, the, uh, which I have just read, the following additional consequences of this human specific activity. 
the reproduction of homo appears in one aspect as appropriation of the objects by the subjects, and in another respect as formation, subjugation of the objects to a subjective purpose, their transformation into results and repository of subjective activity. This gradually alters, alters the world around Homo. The natural milieu is replaced by socio-cultural milieu in which human capacities have become objects, have become objectified. As a consequence of the fact that Homo lives in a hyper-humanized world in which human capacities and needs developed in the past are found as fairy godmothers in their objectified form at the God's headboard in which the results of all previous social development are at his disposition in material form, it is possible for Homo to start his development not in the beginnings of the first principle, but in the point that previous generation have bequest. Work, the objectivation of human nature, constitutes the possibility of history as such. Work changes not only the object, but also the laboring subject itself. It transforms not only the external nature, but transforms homo himself. Producers bring out new qualities in themselves, develop new powers and ideas, new needs and new language. Homo appropriates new human essential potentialities, new properties and new human capacities. Homo forms and develops his own production capacities by objectifying them. Subjective appropriation of means of production implies the formation of a type of activity which puts the means and the object in the necessary relation for obtaining the outcome desired by the subject. This is the idea contained in Capital when Marx compares a builder and a bee, noting that the builder produces first the product in his mind, ideally. Homo is capable, capable then of transforming into laws, into principles of his own activity, a broader and broader range of natural connections and regularities. Uh, despite the fact that each singular act of human activity presupposes the preexistence of a need, in the historical process that relation is inverted. The needs that effectively determine production are not the original needs in their natural harshness, but the needs originated in production itself. The more the needs engendered by production become necessary, says Marx, the more is real well developed. Materially conceived, wealth consists simply in the multiplicity and variety of needs. A rich man, says Marx, is not the one who has a lot. He's a, a, a man who needs a lot. This is the idea in this paragraph. Marcus adds an additional trait of a human essence, homo as a free being. Uh, Marx Marcus reject the idealist interpretation of freedom and in, as independence from real world as exemption from external influences and determinations. Freedom has for Marx a double intimately linked abstract negative and concrete positive meaning. In the negative sense, freedom is freedom from something. It means almost capacity to liberate himself through his real activity from those concrete conditions, relations, characteristics which have turned historically into limitations, into chains. The possibility of this liberation in general is already implied in the fact of human self-consciousness. Homo can make the social determination of his life the object of his activity. That means something that he can consciously influence and change. 
this negatively understood freedom, this constant release and liberation from limitation is at the same time in its historical tendency also the positive concrete meaning of freedom, the power which man procures for himself. It means the development of man's controls and domination over the forces of nature. It means the widening of the scope of human possibilities. It is the formation and cultivation of human creativity of homo's essential powers as an end in itself. But the historical development of homo toward the creation and increase of this freedom on the scale of whole society has not, up to this point, coincided with the formation of free individuals. The individual of the alienated capitalist society who is in general liberated from the personal dependencies and constraints characteristics of earlier ages is an abstract, fortuitous, accidental individual. That is, he is an individual whose life and activity, though free in a legal sense, are in fact determined by conditions and social circumstances that act objectively and independently of him. Hence, he is a person for whom his life is not an expression of his personality, does not mean the realization of his individual potential, potential the actualization of his freedom. The freedom of the individual, made possible through the elimination of the antagonism between essence and existence, social and individual development, objectivation and self-realization, means that each individual will be able to decide himself consciously within the historically circumscribed range of the objective possibilities offered to him by the whole of social development and to realize them in his life. Marcus discusses extensively how human essence manifests in history. This goes beyond the time constraints of this lecture, so I will only pinpoint some important ideas. He denies that human essence is the ensemble of those fundamental traits which remain untouched by the historical development of mankind which are inseparable from homo as such and are characteristic of every individual. <laughs> I, I was told 40 minutes, not so late. Sorry, I prefer it for 40. <laughs> this interpretation, says Marcus, cannot be reconciled with Marx's text. As a result of alienation, it is precisely the human essence which is alienated and taken away from the proletariat in the sense that it cannot realize it in its own life. The universality of man, which figures in Marx as a tendency of the overall historical development, can hardly be understood at all as a constant feature or condition of individuals. Work, sociality, and consciousness can indeed be conceived as necessary and permanent traits of every human individual. But when conceived in this way, their meaning loses those philosophical characteristics which Marx took to be their substance. Work from being free self-activity in which man forms, develops, and appropriates his own capacities becomes under the increasing one-sidedness and the formation of its subject. Thus, this activity is not work in the anthropological philosophical meaning of the term, but merely abstract labor. The case is similar with homosociality. Uh, I skip it. Uh, Marcus arrives at an original and profound vision of the Marxian co concept of the human essence and of human history. Marx meant by human essence primarily those characteristics of the real historical existence of mankind which make it possible to comprehend history as a continuous and unified process that has a development tendency. The universality of Homo and his freedom mark the general conscious social being engaged in material productive self-activity refers to those necessary traits, those dimensions of this total development process on the basis of which the above historical tendency unfolds. 
Uh, Marcus adds that uh, for Marxism, uh, history is always seen uh, from a definite perspective. He, he argues that it's the radical needs of the proletariat, later he changed, like he said, of humanity as a whole, the radical needs which uh, uh, show the perspective from which we, one has to interpret story, history. Uh, according to Marx, it is just the fact that man has a history in the strict sense of the term that constitutes the real specificity of human existence. And therefore, to abstract man from this historicity would mean to disregard his most essential trait. History is the process of human self-creation in the direction of an increasing freedom and universality, and Marcus adds brilliantly, and the principal characteristic, the true essence of Homo, lies precisely in the presence of this self-activity, whereby he creates and forms his own subjectivity. The individual becomes and is a human individual precisely because he has appropriated some of the objectified results and achievements of previous human progress. Thus, the real unity of the human species itself cannot be comprehended apart from this historical process, but only in and through it. This unity is actually nothing but the inner unity and continuity of the process of human history. For Marx, the human essence lies precisely in the essence or e inner unity of the total social development of humanity. Uh, I am being pressured on, by time. I calculated 40 minutes. I, the organizers changed this in the last second, <laughs> minute, hour. Uh, so I'm trying to skip. Uh, let me just uh, finish this part by reading these ideas by Marcus, which brings the word prehistory. Uh, it's the only part of his book. And this is what differentiates man's kind prehistory the history of his origin from his future actual real history. For the concept of prehistory, which traverses Marx's whole life work, is not to be understood as a simple metaphor. The process of human genesis is, according to Marx, not completed with the formation of Homo sapiens as a biological species. Indeed, this is only the starting point and foundation from which Homo socio-historical genesis departs and begins. The social genesis is the process of prehistory, which at the end gives rise to the human species as mankind. Only through the process of alienation can that positive weld of objectified human needs and capacities emerge, which constitute the fundamental objective precondition of human emancipation. I skipped the negative aspects of alienation and I only <laughs> come back to this. Up to here, uh, Marxist uh, philosophical anthropology. Uh, the next element in my if you can see the is to confront these philosophical anthropological ideas with what evolutionary sciences know and i'm not going to read the text i'm just going to tell you uh, that uh, uh, Paleoanthropologists uh, distinguish three features to identify uh, human evolution. Bipedality, walking in two legs, uh, being erect, uh, the size of the brain, and the building of tools, the fabrication of tools. And in the discussion I present here, it is clear that bipedality occurred five million years before the production of stone tools. Uh, so 
quoting Darwin, it is clear that during uh, these five million years, bipedal apes, especially completely bipedal apes, which had the, their hands liberated, could throw stones with uh, 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 aiming at the, at the target correctly. And uh, this gave the use of natural tools. Uh, so human beings uh, started by using natural tools, stones, uh, pieces of uh, good, etc. And the interesting point is the interaction between the brain, the size of brain, and the fabrication of tools. Up, uh, chimpanzees cannot fabricate tools. There have been many experiments trying to teach them to fabricate tools. It was impossible. The Homo habilis, which is regarded Homo habilis as the first human being to fabricate a stone tool, had uh, a brain twice as big as uh, present-day chimpanzees. And it requires a cognitive capacities to be developed a lot. So I finish this uh, section of confronting. This is what we have to do. Marx's idea had to be confronted with evidence and with present science knowledge. And uh, this is what I try to do in my paper. The main conclusion I derive is that Marx Marcus' convictions on the central role of tool making in human essence and history, central to Marxist philosophical anthropology, come out of this confrontation with evolutionary science, successful and strengthened. Uh, and now the, the other point, uh, the text of the Grundrisse. Uh, I already read uh, the phrase when Marx says that the production of exchange value breaks down when science is applied to production, labor loses its central role and becomes a superintendent, uh, etc. Uh, and this, I have it, it's 17 points. Uh, perhaps I will only read the last one. Uh, machines, finishes this passage, Mark saying, machines are organs of the human brain created by the human hand, objectified power of knowledge. The development of fixed capital reveals the degree to which the general intellect in English, in the original German text, which is now the central productive force controls the conditions of the social process. In this passage by Marx, Marx puts into doubt the validity of labor theory of value uh, when the industrial, when science and technology are applied because Labor is a secondary activity, and uh, I read you the phrase. So, the rest of the text of my uh, lecture is first showing what is happening today in terms of automation, uh, in terms of uh, elimination of uh, human beings from the direct process of production, uh, quoting uh, authors like uh, Radovan Richter, uh, the Czech group who wrote uh, Civilization at the Crossroads, which saw after the Second World War, it became obvious that cybernetics is, was going to transform uh, the production process because it's, it's a closed information information comes back and feeds back. So uh, in the 60s, two groups of people, on the one hand, the, this group in the Prague uh, Spring, uh, Radovan Richter and co-authors, and on the other hand, uh, 
Robert Oppenheimer and a group of scientists in the United States in 1963 directed a letter to the President of the United States uh, telling him to implant a guaranteed income because the revolution uh, and the, well, I feel very bad when I have to, uh, they say, I quote them, the continuance of the income through jobs link as the only major, major mechanism for distributing effective demand for granting the right to consume now acts as the main break on the almost unlimited capacity of a cybernated productive system. This I compare with the phrase, the famous phrase from the prologue, from forms of development of the productive forces, this relation turned into their fetters. Marx, 1859, and uh, Oppenheimer and the other groups coincide. Uh, the evidence, there's a lot of books being written on what's happening in, with automation. Uh, Perhaps the most important fact is that the uh, discussions uh, among the big owners of great transnationals and the International Monetary Fund are already taking this into seriously. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Uh, Jobs are not being created, they are being eliminated. That's the absolute consequence and capitalism needs jobs, not for what they can do in production. This can be substituted by robots because, but for what they can consume with their salary. So the objective limit of capitalism is coming to a real, real end today. And the last part of my lecture is, what can we do? And you are all aware of the basic income idea. Uh, in Mexico, we call it the universal citizen's income, a, an amount, a lump sum of money paid to every individual in a country in the world uh, to guarantee a decent level of living. It is not a dream. It is the only possibility for humankind to be saved. As I said in the end of my lecture, it's either we implant some sort of universal citizen income or Capitalism will uh, enter apocalypse era because it won't be able to sell what it can produce and crisis will be every day. So they will promote wars, they will promote destruction in order to avoid this, the end of capitalism. If the basic uh, income is implanted, there could be a soft transition from capitalism to post-capitalism. And as I say, I think it's the last, uh, this liberation would lead us in a couple of generations at the most to a society that we have not even dared to dream about. Sorry for taking more than the reglamentary time. Well, thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Boltrinik. Uh, I think that it's appropriate that we should reflect on uh, Professor Boltrinik's insights over lunch and direct our questions to him then uh, after, uh, after reflection. So I uh, thank you all for your attention during this first half of the day. And we 
Thank you, Professor Toporowski and Professor Boltwinik. I request Dr. Sunita Lal to present you with the memento.